the privilege of being asked to substitute for Brian, uh, who's going to be away for the next two Sundays. He's traveling, and I hope I can do justice to his, um, his premise and his class, um, uh, making the Bible come alive. We're taking various uh, passages, various um, characters from the Bible and applying it to our lives and seeing how the principles work uh, for ourselves. And I hope we can, I can be up to this task. Um, I'm going to do, I'd like to go through John chapter 9. One of the things that he asked us to do is pick our favorite chapters and, um, and apply them to ourselves. And this is one of mine. Uh, now, the first three verses in this chapter open up a whole new topic to, to talk about, and I don't really want to talk about it today. We don't have time, but we probably need two or three classes if you're going to start talking about um, suffering and why do people suffer. Uh, do they suffer because of their own sins or other people's sins? Uh, how much is it related to sin and all of this kind of thing? Essentially, this is a very important piece in that study, but uh, I'd sort of like to just read it and let it sit uh, rather than uh, spend a lot of time on it. What I'd really like to talk about is the blind man who is healed and the Pharisees who were having such a hard time believing that he really was healed. And I've been on both sides of this equation, really, on both sides of the truth, really, as far as this goes. Um, the main thing Jesus was going to prove here or demonstrate here was that he was the light of the world. And we'll see that. And I, I'd like to just introduce this idea a little bit and then we'll read the text and talk about it. Um, if the lights are out and it's really dark, you might as well be blind, right? If you're in a place where there's no light, if you've ever been in a cavern, and you know, and, and they're almost always the guide will turn the lights out to make you feel how mm, oppressively dark it is when you can't, don't have any sunlight at all. Uh, it's like being, being blind even though your eyes work. And what it is, you can't see the reality of what's around you. Um, it's like there isn't anything around you, but you know there must be, but you can't see it. And so you don't know the reality that's around you. And if I was genuinely blind and I started to walk forward, I would bump into stuff, right? And there's, there's a whole part of the Christian way of thinking and a whole part of really Jesus' teaching that assumes that there is objective reality, that what is real exists apart from our opinion about it. It exists apart from uh, my feelings about it, whether I believe it exists or not. Uh, if I were blind and I didn't believe that this um, pulpit existed, I didn't think it believe, uh, believe it, but I kept on walking, eventually I would be convinced that there was something in front of me because I trip over it. So there's a reality outside of myself that represents the truth. The question is, can I see it? Or can I feel it, touch it? Can I see it with my eyes? Do I recognize the truth? And so one of the things Jesus is saying here um, is that he's the light of the world. And part of that is the idea when the light goes on, you can see the truth. Okay? So here we have this blind man whom Jesus heals. And he can see all of a sudden. He knows what, he can see the world. And of course, he himself is part of, is a fact of truth, really, isn't he? I mean, he's a piece of evidence that Jesus uh, is who he says he is, that he is the light of the world. And so he himself is a part of that evidence. And, and people around him are saying, well, you can't have been healed. Really? How did he really? And, he, and they dig into him, you see. And they try to convince him that maybe he got it all wrong, and he's not going to change. He's not going to change. He, he started to start realizing things about Jesus as we go along, and we'll see this. And, and so he's convicted. Jesus is the man. You can say anything you want about Jesus, but I know that I was blind and I see. 
And, and just like the song that we sing, that, uh, that really comes from 2 Timothy 1 uh, in, in verse or, uh, 12. I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted him until that day. And that was the way this blind man was during his trial here. Well, you say what you want, but I can see. I know. I know who I believe. Uh, and so, so he was on that side, and we're on that side too, by and large. But sometimes, you know, we I get shaky, right? I mean, I know if you do, do uh, sometimes. You know, maybe we doubt who we believe, or we, we sort of forget what he did for us. We forget how he rescued us and all that kind of stuff, and we get a little shaky. And sometimes we do that. But, but it pays for us to re-examine those things and, and realize the truthfulness of what we have said yes to and to grow in that and to grow in the evidence of it and appreciate the evidence for it. On the other side, we have the Pharisees who didn't want to believe it. And I was like that. I was a lot like that when I was um, not a Christian. Um, I believed in science, and if you couldn't, if science couldn't explain it, it did not exist. And everybody who thought something about eternal life or about God or Jesus were, were just ignorant dummies. I don't know what other words I would have used, but, and I had a whole, a whole lot of ammunition in my, in my machine gun ready to try to shoot down anybody who tried to convince me otherwise. And I would fire the bullets really fast, you see. And so all of these little objections I had, as soon as they started to answer one, I'd come in from a different direction and I could play a game, you know, and get them walking around in circles. But I was keeping any facts that they might present to me at a distance. I, I really don't want to see the evidence. I just want to look wise and smart and I just want to tear you down. And in a way, that was sort of the way the Pharisees were. They had different motives. They weren't taking a scientific, secular view of things, but they wanted to shoot Jesus down, right? And so there they were, like I was, not wanting to accept facts that were standing right before them, not willing to accept witnesses that were standing there right before them. Um, and so that's part of it. And they needed, well, they needed this um, little speech or piece of the speech that John Adams gave um, all the way back in Boston. And I think it was 1775, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm wrong. Um, there was the Boston Massacre. There were a number of British troops, uh, a fair number of British troops armed, and they ended up shooting a whole bunch of colonists in the square, in, 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 in the uh, main square, and it was known as the Boston Massacre. And of course, it was hyped up to be a massacre. And the, the trial was about, was it really a massacre or the troops acting in self-defense or some of them acting in self-defense or not? And John Adams took the unlikely and unpopular task of defending the British troops. And of course, he was a patriot, he, he wanted you know, independence from the colony, you know, from, from Britain, but he was, he was defending these guys. And part of his speech to the jury, and you know, it, it, was, it was like a, a mob mentality, a, you know, a, a lynch mob mentality going around outside. And one of the things he said was this, and it's, it's such a true thing, and it's something that the Pharisees needed to hear, and sometimes I need to hear it. Uh, John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Nor uh, is the law less stable than the fact. And, and he's underlining this basic principle really that has to do with Christianity and Jesus' claim to being the truth. You can say whatever you want to about the truth, but the truth is the truth. And facts are facts. 
And so what are you going to do? Are you going to push the facts back and keep from hearing it? Or are you going to examine it and say, well, you know, is this for real? Is it true? Is it going to happen? And so this would be a warning for the Pharisees and be a warning for us. Are we going to be people of the truth? Are we going to be people who really wants to see what is real, to see spiritual reality as well as physical reality? Are we going to be that kind of people who want to know the real truth behind stuff? Behind what's going on in our world, but also behind what's going on in the world that we can't see, the world that Jesus came from, uh, and, and the facts and truth about God and the facts that Jesus came to bring. So he talks about blind and blind. There's a blindness in a physical sense, but there's also a blindness in a spiritual sense. And I was blind in a spiritual sense. I didn't want to hear about this Jesus stuff. And I kept pushing it away. And, um, and I changed. But this is the kind of process I think we'll see in, in John chapter 9. I'd like to read. Um, I'd, I'll start in verse 5. No, no, I'll read the whole thing. I'll, I'll read verses 1 to 12. We'll make a few uh, observations. Maybe we could talk about it. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied it, the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who had previously seen him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but it's like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man who was called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Well, let's just stop here for a minute. This is before the trial begun, begins. He comes back to the neighborhood and all the people from the neighborhood, some of them say, well, wait a minute. What? I mean, you see somebody who's blind uh, and, and you're used to somebody who's blind and then all of a sudden they're walking around, they don't have the dark glasses on anymore and you can see that their eyes are focusing on you and they're obviously sighted. You, well, is that the man or isn't it? Looks like him. And that's what they were asking. Um, a couple of things I, 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 I'd like to ask, um, and we don't, well, I'll ask some things that we don't have answers for, uh, or we might have answers for, but we don't know for sure. Um, I, wonder how, I wonder how Jesus and the disciples knew that this man was blind from birth. It doesn't really say, so I mean, there isn't any right answer. And you know, the mystery, the, uh, the hidden things belong to God, so we shouldn't really be fixed on that. But they knew he was blind from birth. Maybe he was just a local who had always been there and they just knew. I mean, it was, it was gotten around, you know? We know, I mean, we, we know that Ray Charles is a blind person and you know, I, he wasn't blind from birth, was he? he he became blind when he was four or five, wasn't him? Um, but, you know, we, we know about certain people, and somebody's been begging in the neighborhood for a long time, you know a story. And it's quite likely that's the way it was. The people in general in the neighborhood knew that. Wasn't this the man that kept on begging? And uh, here's another interesting little piece. Um, how did the man describe what happened to him in verse 11? What does it say? Uh, 
what, what does he say happened to him? A man called Jesus anointed his eyes. How did he know the guy's name was Jesus? There, there, you know, there's no, there isn't any recorded, uh, there ain't anything recorded about any kind of introduction here, you know. He probably asked somebody. He may have. He may have, or maybe, or maybe he heard about Jesus, or maybe he heard Jesus talking with his disciples. He might have heard Jesus preach in the neighborhood. We don't know exactly, but somehow he knew, somehow he knew that it was Jesus who anointed his eyes whether he identified him at the point where his eyes were anointed or whether somebody told him later, I don't know. Now, why did he go and wash in the pool of Siloam? Because Jesus told him to? Yeah. It was better for him to do it than not to do it. Yeah, I mean, what do you got to lose? I mean, well, it's, you know. He mud, so. Pardon? He did have mud, so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to get rid of that. But he could have, he could have chosen to go, go home and wash uh, or just get a bucket of water and wash off on the spot. Um, he must have had some inkling that it would be worthwhile for him to do what this man said, especially if he already knew that the guy's name was Jesus and had a reputation. Um, but he must have had enough faith somehow in the man that anointed his eyes that it would be worthwhile to go through all of the trouble to work his way through the crowd to get to the pool of Siloam as opposed to some other place where there's an easier way to wash. But he did it, right? And, and what do you call that? Oh, you, you, it, I'm sorry? Faith. There was a certain amount of faith. He, he, trusted, he trusted in the one who told him to go wash. And so he had a certain amount of faith in Jesus. It may, it may have been a wish so, hope so kind of a faith, or it might have been, okay, well, he's healed a bunch of other people. I'm going to make sure I do it. We don't know. But he did it. And then what happened? Bling, he saw. He saw, you know. So you have a little bit of space, and Jesus would always say, you know, if you have the face the size of a mustard seed, you know, you could say to this mountain, move. It isn't the size of the faith that matters, it's the one you have faith in that matters. It's the power of the one you have faith in. And of course that power worked in this man, and he came back seeing. Now you can imagine what kind of faith he'd have in Jesus. If he was, you know, he was, well, I better, you know, I'm going to try it out. I want to see how this works, you know. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was thinking, well, you know, I'll just see how this works out. Did you ever do that? Or he asks you to do something, and well, I'll try it and see. Not really being convinced, but once you do it, what happens? Well, yeah, it works. Maybe I'll try it again. So, Again, the faith tends to grow as we tend to act on it, doesn't it? You ever have that happen to you? Um, it's happened to me many times. And, yeah. In, in that illustration, the faith and obedience, who comes first, the obedience or the faith? Well, the faith, the faith and obedience work together, but usually the faith comes first. Uh, well, yeah, because you have to trust that what is being asked of you is legitimate for you to go ahead and do it. So you have to have a certain amount of faith to, to obey. I suppose you can obey without faith. Um, or if your faith is in something else, you know, like, well, if, like if you're a little kid and you're and your parents and your parents are forcing you to do something. Well, you have faith that you're going to get a spanking if you don't do it, but you don't have faith that Jesus is going to reward you if you do it. You see, so it's not faith in Jesus, but it's faith in something else. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think, I think sometimes obedience, you obey and your faith is rewarded. Mm -hmm. Even a little tiny bit of faith, then it increases. And so becomes a cycle. Right. So I think about Naaman, whenever he was told to go wash in the Jordan, he had no use for it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Excellent example. And it, and it probably was this way with this man, too. Uh, you know, we don't know how much faith he had to begin with, but he had enough to do what Jesus told him to do. And then from there, it was, wow, he made me see. And now we get to see what kind of faith he had under fire by the Pharisees. Um, the Pharisees were trying to pull something, do something, and it's understandable my having been in their shoes at some time, in a sense. Um, they're trying to shoot it down. Um, well, let me, let me just go through the text. I won't do illustrations. Let's just go to, go to the text. Um, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees were also were asking him again, again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. And they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him that they had been blind, that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So his parents, verified the fact that he was genuinely blind, was genuinely born blind, that he was really genuinely their son, but anything more than that they were afraid to say anything about, right? Because they'd be punished if he said the word Jesus in connection with the miracle. And that's why they, they backed out. Um, it reminds me of, well, there was a guy named, um, what was it? Oh, I had it written down, and now I forget. Uh, the great Randy, I don't know if you heard of him. It was back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he wrote books, and he did uh, documentaries. And his, his purpose in life was to shoot down um, spiritists and faith healers and, um, and people that he judged to be charlatans, you know. And so he would go and he would investigate. You know, the people got healed in miracle healings, and he would investigate oh, the, the guys who supposedly miraculously bent spoons and stuff like that, and he was able to explain it away. And that's what he did. And that's exactly what the Pharisees are trying to do here. But they were being unsuccessful. Why were they being unsuccessful? Because it actually happened. Because the guy actually was born blind, and he actually was healed. Why wouldn't you believe that? Why would they believe it? They didn't want to. That would mean saying something about Jesus they just didn't want to admit, right? They didn't want to face the fact that maybe the Messiah wasn't uh, as strict about keeping the Sabbath as they were. Maybe the Messiah didn't share their, their sacred cows that they had. In their, in their bank of faith, you know? Yeah. Makes you wonder if maybe today we struggle with believing that God answers prayer and yeah. people get well because uh, I prayed for somebody and they didn't get well. Does that say something about me? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, th that's a struggle sometimes that we have. 
And of course, the, again, part of that, this this will be a big long study, but yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did though. Um, sometimes we expect if God is real, he's going to answer us just like, he's going to respond to us just like a vending machine. If we put our, uh, we put our dollar 25 in, we'll get the kind of soda we want if we push the right button. When actually God is our father, who's going to say yes or no to our requests according to his own wisdom and his own judgment. Brendan. Mm -hmm. I think looking back at the Pharisees, it's very hard to reevaluate their decision, especially the spiritual matters. Yes. Because you do lose membership in their defects. Yeah. The Pharisees said, uh, Jesus did that. They could be starting to send God himself. So it takes yes. a lot of courage to reevaluate the position. Yes. If, exactly. If there is a position that there is a lot of uh, community support for, and all of a sudden there's information that jars with that, there's a, a, an extreme pressure. To, uh, to go along with the crowd and not go along with the truth as you see it. And so here's the dilemma, and of course this is the dilemma that the blind person's in too, and the blind person's parents. Um, and for us, we've held this belief for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden there's this piece of information, the stubborn facts that start coming in and the stubborn facts are pointing in a different direction and it's like a pebble in your shoe and you can't get rid of it, you know, because it's there, it's really there. And this was the kind of thing that was happening here. Um, I'll continue to read 24, I'll, I'll, I'll read it all the way through, make a few comments and then I think we're gonna have to adjourn. Uh, people are taking attendance, I don't know if they're gonna be saying amen to the class yeah, so it's time. I'll, I'll just do a little reading and then we'll stop. The second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Then he answered, whether this man is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though he was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? You notice what happened. First it was Jesus, the man called Jesus, anointed my eyes and now I see. And then Jesus is a prophet. And now it's, you don't want to be his disciples too. He's counting himself as Jesus' disciple, even though he wouldn't recognize Jesus by sight because he hadn't seen Jesus with his eyes yet. And they reviled him. Well, they couldn't deal with it. They could not deal with the stubborn facts. And the only thing they could do is insult him and kick him out. You're his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, well, here's an amazing thing that you do not worry, know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anybody had opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you are born entirely in sins, and you're teaching us. And so they kicked him out of the synagogue. And then Jesus encounters the man Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out and finding him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you've both seen him and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Notice how the depth of faith that was increasing in this blind man as he was grappling with the significance of what had happened to him. <coughs> um, it wasn't a, well, this is what God did to me now, what's he gonna do next kind of a thing. But he was deeply changed by the things that God had worked in him and through him. And so finally, Jesus sums up the whole lesson. Uh, 
In verse 39, for judgment, I came into the world. This is not, not condemnation judgment, but a separation. I came into the world uh, that, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we're not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, we see, your sin remains. Uh, a blind man who doesn't know he's blind isn't going to go to the pool of Siloam to wash. If we're spiritually blind and we don't know that we're spiritually blind, we're going to remain blind. Even though we think we see and we think we have all the answers. And I've been on both sides. I, I imagine we all have at certain times. Um, the Israelites, they saw the ten plagues. They walked through the, the Red Sea. They participated in all of the miracles. And it was just a matter of days before they were ready to start complaining and saying, well, where is God? Is he really with us or not? And they participated in God's salvation and healing and freeing, but they didn't take it deeply enough into their faith in order to hold on all of the way. And that's our challenge. And that's my challenge, too. And I wish we had more time to talk, but thank you. <laughs>